Good morning. Uh, my name is James Ovel, and today our reading will be from Psalm 85, 1 through 13. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Selah. You withdrew all, all your wrath and turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, some of you have already walked up to me and said one of two things this morning. The first one is, Jeremy, where is your sports coat? The second one is, Jeremy, what is that sweatshirt all about? This sweatshirt is the future rebrand of Clear Branch. And I'm super excited about the opportunity for us to be able to reclaim to return to some of the things that were very much the nature of this church when it started. Some of you guys have been here for so long that you remember what that early image looked like. It was a circle. It had green rolling hills. It had the sunshine. It had a cross. It had a creek running through the middle of it. Uh, this is not a circle, but there's definitely a kind of mountainous area and a creek and a cross. For a long time, people have asked where my church was. And I told them that I served at Clear Branch. 25 years ago, people would have said, oh, they're clearly different. And now people say, where's that? We got to fix that. We need a logo with a cross on it. We need something that's recognizable to this community, not merely in our words and actions, but also in the way that we present ourselves in terms of appearance. And so beginning... In January, this logo will be the new logo for this church. It's not something that I came up with on my own. I'm excited about it for sure. You guys have no idea how long our staff has worked on this logo. If I could show you the iterations that it went through, you would probably laugh at us because it was random. Um, there was a period of time where there was a hexagon with olive leaves uh, there was a lot of things, a lot of things. They put in a ton of effort, and it was with the help of the Franklins, of Brindley, and of Chris specifically, uh, we kind of began to refine this and, uh, and get this image where it is today. And uh, if you haven't met the Franklins, you need to. Chris is a, a firefighter here. He invited me to go ride along in the fire truck yesterday in the parade. Sucker. I don't know. Uh, but uh, great friends and uh, great help as we moved through this process of kind of redefining what the logo of Clear Branch would look like. So I'm excited about it. It's on the screen behind me. Um, and you guys will be seeing more and more and more of that in the weeks and the months and the years ahead. And for that, I'm grateful. But how are you this morning? Good. Some of you guys sound great. Some hoops and some hollers, some wonderfuls, a lot of silence. It's okay. It's all right. I understand. It's early still. And we find ourselves this week in the second week of Advent. Last week we talked about hope. This week we will talk about peace. How many of us need a little peace in the midst of this season? Yeah, for sure, right? Amen. We need some peace. And we need some peace because we have lives that are inundated by so much stuff. Covered up by emotion and responsiveness. 
Hear me say this. You in this postmodern world are not alone in the way that your lives are impacted by stress and worry. In fact, a vast number of theologians argue that Psalm 85, which was just read by my son James, pretty good job there, buddy, appreciate you, is all about countering our world of anxiety and scarcity and this idea that we have to be self-sufficient or about denial or about theologic amnesia, about despair. And instead, it's rooted in God's promise. And God's promise or God's presence is a promise keeper. That God does not make promises to us that he does not desire to fulfill. That he does not bring about transformation in us that's not intended to make us better than we were before. So in the midst of this season, though, culture and society tells us so frequently that it's all about gifts and celebration. And yeah, it can be. Jenny, I've had the blessing of spending time with many of you guys in your small group Christmas parties. Y'all are great. The food's amazing. Thank you. I'm going to need a diet in January. But our lives are not always about the celebration and this joy and this season. Sometimes they're caught up in the recognition of our worry and our stress, of our loss and our grief. And so when the psalmist wrote this, he proclaimed the nature of God's steadfast love and loyalty, his faithfulness and righteousness, his peace and wholeness, the very nature of things that we probably need to hear proclaimed over us today. You see, with that in mind, I wonder where we are in this. I wonder if we are perceiving this time of year to be a time of celebration, or does it feel more like a time of worry? Is it celebration, or does it feel more like a time that's like celebration on top of mourning? And we're going to have the opportunity, and I say opportunity because it is necessary for us to dig into what our responses are to the impact of the things that we experience in life. We're going to do that at our service of loss and light, but on some level today we're going to talk about it as well. The psalmist was intentional about proclaiming peace to a group of people that felt like their lives were anything but peaceful. And it's with that in mind that I look to the first verses today, Psalm 85, 1 through 2. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. This is a proclamation of what God has done for us in our past. It is the realization, if you're following alone in your notes, that Advent allows us to appreciate past peace. We are where we are today because God has provided what we needed in the days that led to this point. We cannot forget that God is not merely a God of future promise, but a God of fulfilled promise in our lives. And sometimes our circumstances, sometimes our emotions, sometimes our brokenness leads us to be a people that forget that God was working yesterday as much as he is today and as much as he will tomorrow. And so I wonder where are the places in your lives that you have experienced a peace that surpasses all understanding where you have experienced the blessing and the goodness of God poured out upon you and that sets you up on this day to be able to proclaim God's mighty works. Is it in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death? Is it in the face of sickness and brokenness? Is it in relationships that have been torn apart and yet God has the unique ability to renew them and restore them? Remember for the people of Israel, this is a people that went through cycles where they were absolutely on point in their relationship with God, or they were off the charts in moving a different direction than God. They either got it right or they got it terribly, terribly wrong. 
And so many of the Psalms are proclamations of what God has done in the midst of struggle and difficulty in their lives at that very moment. If we are a people that are able to understand that God provides us with peace, then restoration and forgiveness and pardon in our past, then we should be a people that can expect that God offers us restoration and forgiveness and pardon in our future. You see, God does not only work once in a while. God is at work in our lives at all times. Last week we talked about the responsibility that we have in proclaiming God's mighty deeds as we share the hope that he makes possible in our lives. And this week we really begin to dive into the understanding that we're intended to not merely acknowledge and to remember, but also to be people who have a unique expectancy that God will do these things again. Verses 1 through 3 focus on highlighting the work of God and God alone in offering favor and restoration and forgiveness, but also in covering and withdrawing wrath and, and turning from anger and giving us second chances And I wonder how many of us desire a second chance this day. That as we think about the celebration of Advent, as we await the celebration of the coming of Jesus to earth in the form of a child that that originally is in a manger, but that would grow up to be a king and a savior, do we need to be reminded that that's done for us? Not because we're worthy, not because of what we can do, not because we deserve it, but instead because of God's amazing love for us. So perhaps today in this place, you need to be reminded quite simply that God loves you. That he loves you in spite of and in light of your brokenness. That he loves you in spite of and in light of your sinfulness. And that he has a hope and a plan and a purpose for your life if you will merely surrender it to him so that he may do with it as he desires. But it does not stop there. Because Advent is a reminder of God's promises And those promises show up again and again in Scripture. Whether you're talking about Abraham being called out of Ur of the Chaldeans and he's taken to the promised land for the first time, or you're talking about Moses encountering God at the burning bush, or perhaps being able to see him pass by as he's placed in the cleft of a rock. Or you're talking about Job who experiences loss and brokenness that seems unbelievable to us as his entire world gets turned upside down. God is present and God's promises are real. And what that allows us to do is to be able to expect and to proclaim that what God has done for those before us, that God is continuing to do for us. And I wonder if that's something that we merely read and let go in one ear and out the other, or if it plants itself in our hearts and in our minds. And allows us to have peace. I will tell you that the most common times in my life where I experience the least amount of peace happen when I attempt to do it all by myself. Happen when I believe that I can somehow make all the things that need to to, to kind of fall into place fall into place. My peace is broken when I think that it's about what I can do instead of recognizing as we say again and again in this place that it is about what God and God can do alone through Christ and Christ alone. And yet like the Israelites, we just think we need to do a little bit more. 
in one of the major struggles throughout the Old Testament. In the face of a God that provides like a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire, a God that parts the sea, a God that provides manna from heaven, a God that brings water from the rock, a God that does all of these amazing things that are undeniably beyond what Moses could do himself, for instance. One of the greatest struggles in the Old Testament is idolatry. As the people of Israel say, well, gosh, you know, this one God, he's, this God is great. He's done amazing things. But just to cover our bases, let's, let's, let's set up some altars to something else. And I wonder if we're setting up altars in our own lives. Attempting to capture and to maintain peace through our own effort instead of understanding that it is by God. Do we find peace in our 401k? <laughs> Do we find peace in a house that's perfectly decorated? Do we find peace in the light that randomly turns on? I don't know what one of you guys over there is doing, but God says, I see you. No, I'm joking. That's not true. I'm going to start using that on a regular basis. What's going on over there, huh? But if we believe that God sees all things, And if we believe that God is the giver of, wow, Dennis Abercrombie. Maybe it's the Dobbs. I don't know. Some shenanigans going on over there. But if we believe that God is the creator of all things and the giver of all blessing, then should we not be able to find and experience peace no matter where we ourselves reside in this moment? That in the face of pain, God is still God. In the face of loss, God is still God. In the face of sickness, God is still God. In the face of family brokenness, God is still God. So today, as we proclaim that God is a God of promise, hear this. Let me hear what the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. See, God's promises are what makes peace possible. God's promise is meant to generate change among his people, but catch this in the word. God speaks his promise. The word there is debar. He literally vocalizes. He produces these promises, proclaiming them to us. But if you look at verse 8, you wind up finding what we have to do in response to that. We have to shema. We have to hear what God the Lord speaks. We wind up in places where peace is elusive to us because we are not spending time in the word of the Lord. Because we are not opening our hearts and our minds to be able to hear and to take in what it is that God is saying to us. See, the people of Israel did that without fail. They, they would hear God proclaim these things. They would, they would experience God's amazing blessing, and then they would go, na 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 right? They would totally like block off what they're hearing and move on to something else, as though, again, in one ear and out the other, and yet what God calls us to be is a people that have his word written upon our hearts. So when we find ourselves this season in places where we need to be reminded of God's peace, the place for us to look is not within ourselves and our own efforts and our own capacities, but instead to the Word of God and to have ears and eyes and hearts that hear it. I know some of you are going, you can't hear with your eyes. You know what I mean. To perceive it and to receive it. God's word makes a difference. Quite generally, quite specifically, God's word in itself 
is capable of bringing about peace in the midst of our lives. But again, it does not stop there. Because Advent is the intersection of righteousness and peace. And some of you young people are going to get a lancey in this one, so just buckle up. The imagery used here, there's that light again. The imagery used here make you guys a little uncomfortable. Hear this. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Ooh, grody. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Now, some of you guys are saying, why in the world does he say that righteousness and peace will kiss each other? It's because kissing is something that's intimate, right? I mean, there's that piece of like the brotherhood uh, and sisterhood of Christianity, but let's be real, that stopped like 15th century. People quit smooching on each other in church a long time ago, thanks be to God. It was a pretty common thing though, right? You would walk up and you'd kiss the cheek of the person and you'd, you know, it was just a passing of, of, of this like Christian kiss. It was really after the 15th century, but you get the point. Well, it's been a while. But this is about a proclamation of the intimacy that exists between righteousness and peace, so that these two things, as it's explained here, as one comes from the ground and the other from the sky, faithfulness springs up from the ground. Faithfulness is, is one of those things that's tied to the nature of peace for us. They're connected. But faithfulness comes up from the ground and righteousness comes down from above and they meet in the middle as heaven and earth to some degree and there is a kiss and a contact that is intimate. We are able to experience God's peace. We are able to live out faithful lives. We are able to be recipients of the righteousness of Christ made possible through his life and death and resurrection when we are in an intimate relationship with Christ. When we make that a priority, when we allow God to shape us through his word, because when I say through Christ, I'm talking about Christ, the word, the word written and the word made flesh. And it is in that and that alone through Christ and Christ alone that we experience righteousness. And righteousness brings about a whole lot of things. It's not merely about what's right or just. It's about what's suitable and trustworthy. It's the nature of Christ that he offers to us. For he is righteous and he pours out his righteousness upon us. He is righteous and he makes us righteous when we were yet sinners. Not because of what we can do, but because of what he has done and continues to do in our lives. See, what I think the psalmist is doing, like, remember, this is written long before Advent. But it is a proclamation of the expectancy and the peace that the psalmist and the people of Israel longed for. It's a proclamation that our nature would change as a result of Christ's nature. That we would be made different. And that one of the indicators of that difference, of that transformation is shalom, it is peace. If the world around you looks at you, do they perceive you as a person of peace? Or do they perceive you as someone who runs around like their hair is on fire? Those are radically different visuals, right? And we are meant to be a people that are recognizable not merely by word and action, but also by demeanor as being people that are fulfilled by Christ and given peace that's greater than what the world can destroy with its brokenness.
and its sinfulness and its struggle, and its anxiety, and its worry, and its stress. See, so as I ask you today, like, are you people who are are living out what it means to be peaceful, or are you people who feel like everything in the world is coming apart? See, the thing that's different in those two situations is you, not God. God's nature is peace. God's word is peace. God's promise is peace. And so we as postmodern Christians have a responsibility to understand that because of where we are, and because of when we are, and because of who we are, that we're given a unique opportunity to experience God's steadfast love and His faithfulness and to proclaim peace. So at this intersection of righteousness and peace, we find this amazing opportunity to allow God's nature, to allow Christ's message to transform who we are. It is my hope that we would be a people so radically peaceful that we would bring bring peace into every situation that we walk into. That we would be a people that when we show up at our workplaces, that people would say, okay, it's going to be all right. The Christian's here. That we would be a people that would walk into our homes, into our Christmas parties, and into the new year ahead, understanding that God's peace is greater than our struggle. And may it begin with us now in this moment of Advent as God draws close to us and encourages us to draw close to him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your righteousness. We thank you for being trustworthy. We thank you that you are at work in the midst of our lives, restoring and forgiving and pardoning. And as a result of that, that you give us the unique opportunity to live in a way that sets all that mess aside and instead focuses on you. Father, we ask that during this season of Advent, that we would not merely have the opportunity to be expectant about gifts on Christmas morning, but to be expectant and proclaiming of the gift that comes in Christ and Christ alone. Not simply one day, but every day. That we would be a people that that set aside our own hopes and desires and dreams And instead, take on the plan and the purpose that you have for our lives. And may this season of Advent become a launching off point for us as individuals in a community at Clear Branch. May we mark this season as a time in our lives where we have been changed and transformed where we understand that your goodness and that your grace proclaimed throughout the ages is as much a present part of reality then as it is now and it is tomorrow. And may we know your peace. Help us to embody it and to represent it as we strive to represent you to a world that needs it that needs to know you. Give us the strength and the courage 
to honor you in word and deed as carriers of peace. In Christ's name, amen.